How are y'all doing? Good? All right. Kind of a, a, a bittersweet uh, week. I know uh, there's a lot of angst and anxiety about what happened in Santa Fe. I'm going to address that at the very end of, of the service um, today uh, because I do want us to keep our eyes fixed on our mission, especially at a time like this, and not let fear or rage uh, or divisions or ideological warfare distract us at a time like this because uh, we have a greater mission that I believe is the answer uh, to the problems uh, that we're grieving in the first place. And so I want us to keep talking about uh, Jesus today. We're talking specifically for the next two Sundays to graduates. Uh, so we've got a lot of graduates in our congregation. A lot of our high school graduates are um, being honored and recognized in uh, the big sanctuary at, at Real Church uh, today. So they're, they're, they're not here. Next week you're going to not just see them here. You're going to hear from some of them on stage um, with me next Sunday uh, on the 27th. Um, today I want to talk about graduation in general. We've got a lot of high school graduates um, who have really paid the price to get to where they are. You've got a lot of... Uh, college grads who have probably already walked. If you're a college grad, you're probably already done. Congratulations. We've got some uh, law school grads in the community here at the story. We've got medical school grads, PhD grads, other kinds of postgraduate degrees. Um, we've, we've got, you know, middle schoolers that have done the hardest thing of all, which is just to get through middle school and survive middle school, and you're on your way to high school, and, and believe me, in middle school, it gets better. And uh, we've got some kindergarten graduates who have done nothing at all to deserve <laughs> anything. But we honor them anyway for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, we got all kinds of, of graduates here at the story. Um, but the, the truth is uh, we're not just here to talk about um, graduations from school. The graduates um, in our midst are not the only ones who are taking steps forward right now. There are many people here, I would say the majority of people here are or will soon be facing a life-changing decision that means a step in a new direction or a step up some kind of ladder or some kind of change in, in your influence, some kind of promotion, some other kind of graduation. And, and for whatever reason, we have tons and tons of people who are always moving and shaking and, and, and making changes and, and going forward and aspiring towards some new higher level here at the story. That's just the fact of the matter. And so I know we've got a ton of people who are facing these uh, decisions right now or soon will, whether it's a promotion at work. Some of you are maybe sick of the job you have and you've, you've kicked around leaving that company and joining a new company, or maybe you wait it out and see if this company learns to appreciate you for the wonder that you are. You know, like some of you are wondering, well, should I start my own company? We've got a lot of people kicking around that. I, actually, from the 830 and 940 services, I had people texting me or seeing me after the service saying, yeah, I'm kicking around the idea of starting my own business. That's awesome. We've got a lot of people who are industrious uh, in, in that way, uh, entrepreneurial and starting businesses. Um, we've got people that are facing relationship changes and aspiring to different realities and relationships. Maybe you need to break off a bad relationship, but some of you are, are, are looking forward to maybe a proposal or a marriage, maybe having kids. Uh, you know, we've got all kinds of opportunities that are present in the room right now. People that are considering a move away from this city or, or to another part of the city, maybe buying a house. All of these decisions are weighty, and they all bring with them some kind of opportunity to increase. To increase in terms of influence, to increase in terms of income, to increase in terms of happiness. If any of those breakthroughs describe something you're going through, then I hope this little mini-series of two sermons will be for you. Because sometimes, I am afraid, sometimes in churches, Preachers like me give people like you the impression that you should not be proud of ambition. You should not be ambitious. You should not, you know, uh, be successful and be a Christian. Like those two things don't go hand in hand. Now, there are some churches where they tell you those two things only go hand in hand. Like <laughs> if, if you're successful, it means God loves you more. I, I'm not saying that. But I am going to try and bring our ambition out of the shadows because I think that ambition well-placed is a gift from God. And God doesn't want us just sitting around, not working hard and not being ambitious, not wanting the next big thing. God made you that way. The question isn't, do you want the next big thing? The question is, why do you want it and what will you do with it when you have it? 
right? And so it's a good thing to be ambitious, and I want to honor that ambition because I believe God made you that way. I think if you want to conceive of God like this, God is the dad at your graduation who yells your name as you cross the stage just to humiliate you, just to embarrass you, because that's how proud he is of your achievements. God wants believers in high places. God wants believers in high places, not just in the church, but in places of influence in the marketplace, places of industry, in the business world, in social circles. God wants believers in high places, places of influence. Imagine what a different city this would be if every single CEO of every major Houston company was sold out for Jesus. Imagine if every single CEO loved with the heart of Jesus. Imagine what a different city we would have. That's exactly what God wants, I believe. And so for the next two weeks, uh, we're going to talk about it. Because these seasons of promotions, these seasons of graduations can be God-ordained. Now, they can also be potential pitfalls. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, knowing the difference between a, a one that's from God and one that could be a, a pitfall. Um, we're going to talk about having your head on the clouds while keeping your feet on the ground. This is your study guide today. If you want to have this out and ready, you might need it today because I have uh, seven things I want to share with you today. Don't get scared. You're thinking, usually it's just like three or four or five maybe. That sounds long, seven. Uh, <laughs> don't worry. I've got a Little League baseball game, a championship game, by the way, to coach at 1 o'clock. So we're going to be in and out today, all right, in and out. But I do have seven things that I've learned from my own journey about graduating, about being promoted, about aspiring. Seven things I want to share with you, and I'm going to share them by telling you a story from Matthew chapter 20. It starts in Matthew 20, verse 20. And this story, this little story from Matthew 20, illustrates all seven of the things that I want to share with you about these seasons of promotion, these seasons of ascending the ladders of your life. The first thing I want to share with you, the number one thing, is that your mom will never cut the cord for you. Your mom will never <laughs> cut the cord for you. Did you just read that with me? I just want to hear you say it. Your mom won't cut the cord for you. All right. So listen. This is from Matthew chapter 20, verse 20. The mother of Zebedee's sons. So this is two of Jesus' disciples, James and John. Zebedee was their dad. This is their mom. That Jesus called them the sons of thunder. If you know what I'm talking about there and you want to know why they're called the sons of thunder, I think it's a hilarious reason. You can see me after the service. I don't want to say it now. But I, I, think, I think this is, this is their mom, James and John, dragging them maybe, maybe arm in arm, maybe by the ear. I don't, know why, I don't know how, but she has them. She's coming to Jesus with them. Kneeling down, she asked a favor of Jesus. What is it that you want, Jesus said. And she said, grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. So the events we're going to read about in Matthew chapter 20 are taking place during a time in which Jesus' star is rising. Jesus is upwardly mobile. At this point in his life, Jesus is a young professional ascending the ranks. At this point, he is more popular, more successful than he's been his whole life. Every town he goes to, he's like the Pope. People are bringing him their babies for him to bless. People are bringing him sick people for him to heal. Like there's over 10,000 people known to have been following Jesus at this point in Matthew 20, at this point in his ministry. And so he is a bona fide celebrity and a success at this point in his ministry. Now what that means for the 12 disciples is that they too, by proxy, are bona fide celebrities. You know, like they're the entourage. You know, they're the guys that kind of mooch off the real celebrity, but, but they're there. And this is way better than what they had just months before this when they were nobodies, when they were fishermen barely getting by on the Sea of Galilee. So now they're somebodies. Now they've got a life. Now they've got direction. They've got a future. They've got some promise. And, and so th this is the setting in which this story takes place. And it's in that setting that this mother of these two disciples, James and John, uh, brings her sons to Jesus. She drags them and she asks him to promote her boys to first and second officer in Jesus' kingdom. Now, I don't know if she, if she thought Jesus was like going to have an actual earthly kingdom where he was going to go into Jerusalem and, and get Rome out and he was going to be like a warlord and that he would... Their sons would be his, you know, uh, first and second in command. Or well, I don't know if she's talking about a heavenly kingdom. It doesn't really matter. But listen, what you need to know is when you read stories like this in the New Testament, they don't happen out of nowhere. There's always a backstory to how the stuff in the Bible got there. And if you really read this story, it's very clear that one of two things happened. 
to precede this mother, dragging her two sons to Jesus, making this request on their behalf. One of two things. Either, either, and I can't decide which one of these two things is more pathetic, but either it was her idea, and for months she had been just nagging her two boys to, you know, be courageous and step up and go to Jesus and just ask him. Ask him for that promotion. You deserve it. Look how perfect you are, boys. You deserve it. Like, she's that mom. You know that mom? Just nagging and just pressing and just saying, go do it. And, and finally, she just ran out of patience. She ran out of time. She said, this is our moment. Just come with me. And she drags them by their ears to Jesus and she asks for them. That's scenario one. Scenario two may be worse because it might have been the boys' idea. But they were just too scared to follow through on their own. They thought Jesus would be mad at them, and so they made their mom do it. <laughs> one of those two things is true about this story. <laughs> and I, there's a little hint later that it might have been their idea, and they just wanted their mom to do it. So Jesus, you know, she's a sweet old lady, and Jesus won't get mad at her like, they, like he would get mad at them. It's kind of sad, kind of pathetic. Because it's pretty clear that either way, these sons of thunder are just boys in men's bodies. They are, they are grown men acting like adolescents. They're grown men with a career now and a future now. They've got a Jesus who believes in them and called them. But they're still behaving like the babies they were before Jesus. They're still behaving with no spine, with no vision, no courage. And their mother seems more than happy to oblige, as some mothers are prone to do. Insert your Jewish mother joke here. But it's not just Jewish mothers. Like, it's a lot of mothers that are prone to this sort of thing. Like, to, to over, you know, overextend and the, the reach a little bit. Helicopter moms, sort of, who struggle to cut that cord. And what I want to say here at this first point is that every step you take up the ladder, Every time you ascend the ranks, every time you make a change for the good, it will always require you to grow up a little bit and cut the cord. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes the one on the end of that cord is your mother, but not always. Sometimes what's on the other end of that cord is an old habit or an old addiction or an old way of wasting time. Or an old show you watch that does nothing for your soul. Or, uh, you know, an old way of being or talking about people instead of, you know, praying and thinking about big ideas. Like, sometimes you got to cut the cord. But listen, no one will ever do that for you. Your mother or anyone else. You have to be the one to decide. Those days are over. And a new day is coming. And I would rather have that. What will be than what was. No one will cut the cord for you. Number two. You don't know what you don't know, so stay humble. You don't know what you don't know, so stay humble. This is the next verse in Matthew 20. This is verse 22. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Jesus here is not talking to the mother. Even though the mother asked the question, who's he talking to? Them, meaning more than one, probably the two boys. Meaning Jesus knew it was their question all along. <laughs> they just got their mama to ask it, right? You don't know what you're asking. The problem with the New Testament sometimes is that sometimes the word you means one person. Sometimes the word you means a bunch of people. That's why they should have had y'all in the Bible. Y'all would make the Bible so much clearer. So much clearer. Texans have been right all along, y'all. Because Jesus is saying, y'all don't know what y'all are asking. And, and, and he's right. Truer words have never been spoken. You don't know what you don't know. Here's the thing, though. During seasons of graduation, if you're graduating or getting promoted now or considering some big step now, hear this. During seasons of great success, we become deluded. We become deluded to believe that because somebody thought we were worthy of graduation, we must be ready for whatever waits for us on the other side of graduation. Because someone believed in me enough to give me this job, I must be ready for this job. You know, it, it, it's fascinating how self-deluded we become. I think about, uh, I think about coming to Kansas City, uh, coming to, to Houston from Kansas City uh, almost four years ago. In July, it'll be four years when I, Gio and I brought our family from Kansas City here to start something. We didn't know what the name of it was at the time. It became the story. Started from scratch. And we came here so 
a little arrogant, uh, just, uh, just a little full of ourselves. <laughs> because we believed we had the plan. We believed we had the answers. We believed we were ready. Because St. Luke's is a church that's known across the whole world in United Methodist circles as being like a beacon church that knows what it's doing. And St. Luke's hired us. They must think we know what we're doing. And ergo, we know what we're doing. But we didn't. We had no idea what we were doing. We were not ready. And when I look back on my early plans and those journals and things that I kept at the time, it is funny, but it's also frightening how close we came to making the worst decisions. You have no idea how close we got to calling this place Theophilus instead of the story. I am not even joking this close, this close to calling this church Theophilus. Can you ever imagine in a thousand years inviting your friends to join you at Theophilus? No, you wouldn't even be here if it was called Theophilus. Theophilus, what in the world? That was on the top of my list. I don't even understand it. I didn't know what I was doing, right? I was deluded in my head. Another thing that came to mind is when it came time to start the story, we launched. It's very important to launch well. So when you have a, a new beginning, you have to start well. It kind of forms the rest of your trajectory as a community. Well, we launched at the end of February 2015, which meant that weeks three and four were the Sundays straddling spring break. Now, we had only lived in cities where spring break getaways were optional. We did not know the city of Houston where spring break getaways are a universal truth. Everybody leaves. And so week one, we had like 350 people. It was a great, great start. Week two, we had like 250. A little sad, a little less. We were still strong though. 250, that's great. Week three, the first week of spring break, like 100 people showed up, which is less than we had when we started. And week four, 100 people showed up again. We, we panicked, man. We thought it was all over. We had messed up. Nobody likes us. Uh, I'm calling Kansas City to see if our old jobs are still available. <laughs> But <laughs> And our kids are showing out today. Y'all should have been here at 940. It was great. Uh, we, you just don't know. You just don't know when you're starting a new thing, when you're stepping up on a new level. You just don't know what you don't know. So stay humble. Number three, just say yes. Just say yes. This is the next verse in that um, passage. Jesus Ask the two disciples, can y'all <laughs> can y'all drink the cup I am going to drink? We can, they answered. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. As a general rule, whenever God asks you to do something, it's probably a good idea to say yes. I know there's a lot of skeptics in the room, and I've been there where people say they hear from God, and I think, cuckoo, cuckoo. You know, I think... Uh, Maybe they need a, you know, a psychiatrist or something. And I, you know, how do you discern the voice of God from your own ego or from your Bluetooth device? Or how do you, how do you know when God is telling you um, to do things? But I think, uh, I think we kind of we know. These guys knew what Jesus was asking them to do because they knew the scriptures, right? So in the Old Testament, anytime a prophetic uh, figure talked about drinking of his cup, he's talking about suffering because prophets suffered for their message. And Jesus is saying, can you drink from the cup I'm going to have to drink from? He's saying, can you suffer? Are you willing to suffer like I'm going to suffer? And to their credit, they don't say no. They say, yes, we can. And then Jesus says, indeed, you will in a minute. He, he, says, he says, you will. He affirms them, right? But, but when, he, when he asks them that, they say yes with no hesitation. Now, to the skeptics in the room, I want you to challenge your notion that God doesn't speak. I've been where you are and I've sat where you sit. I'm telling you that God speaks to us, asking us to do things all the time. And he'll do it through your conscience. And he'll do it through your sense of wrong and right. Through your sense of absolute good and truth. Morality, he'll ask you, can you get out of your comfort zone for a minute? He'll ask you to love the person that you've been led to hate. He'll ask you, can you forgive the person that hurt you? He'll ask you to do all kinds of things to give more of your time, more of your money, more of yourself away. Can you live with less? All these things are hard. 
Anytime God asks you to do something, it's going to be hard. But listen, having more stuff is not going to make it easier. Mastering the yes at the level you're at now will make it much easier to master that level, that yes, when you're at a different level later. Everything God asks will hurt a little. But I promise you, God will never ask you to do something that he knows you're not able to do. God will only ask you to do things that he knows you're able to do. And God will only ask you to do things that will bring about a better version of yourself. Because he has your best interests at heart. So when God asks you to do something, just say yes. Like these disciples do. Number four. You're not God. God is. Thank God. Could y'all, could y'all just say that one with me? I feel like this is something, I feel like this is something I just need you to hear. I, I need to hear you say. Could you just say it with me? So read it with me. You're not God. God is. Thank God. All right. This should come as welcome news to you. If this is troubling, the idea that you're not God, I'm going to need you to call your therapist and maybe set up an appointment with me or both or something this week because this should be good news, that you are not God and God is. The next verse in this passage from Matthew 20, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those to whom they have, for whom they have been prepared by my Father. All right. I think what Jesus is saying is that there's some things in this life that just aren't up to you. There's some questions, frankly, that we get wrapped around the axle on. And we argue and we fight. And those are hills that we die on. When in fact the questions we're fighting about, we'll never know the answers to in this life. There's stuff that we just shouldn't worry about. Now, there's a lot of stuff that God does let us have power over. Free will is a powerful thing. So you get to make a lot of your own choices. You get to answer a lot of your own questions. Where will I eat this afternoon? That's up to you. How you spend your day, totally up to you. You're going to watch the Astros on Sunday Night Baseball tonight. You're going to watch the Rockets drink Steph Curry's tears. That's totally up <laughs> to you. These things are all choices that you get to make. But at some point, you'll reach a, a level of, of thought and conversation where you'll, you'll get to questions that are not up to you to decide. And you will fight about those questions, and you will lose friends over those questions, and you'll go round and round about those questions. One day, you'll end up an atheist because you couldn't answer those questions. Those questions are not for you to answer. Questions like, who's saved and who ain't? Who's going to heaven? Who belongs in hell? Why does anyone eat Chipotle in Houston, Texas with all these taquerias around? These are not questions you're qualified to answer. Trust me. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of your energy. So you can leave those questions up to God because you think God are not him. Number five. Haters. Haters going to hate. This is from Taylor Swift. Cultural icon. The next verse, when the ten, these are the ten other disciples, when they heard about what had happened with, with James and John, their mom, they were indignant with the two brothers. Indignant is a strong word. They were furious with the two brothers. Why? Why were they furious? Y'all can talk back. Why do you think they were furious? Jealous? That's a pretty good answer. They, they were furious because they think it should have been them. should have been me. Not those two guys. Sons of thunder, please. First and second, nah. nah. That's me, you know. They all believed it should have been them. Why didn't I think of that? Why didn't I go to Jesus? And they're mad because Jesus didn't just give them the backhand. Jesus didn't actually say, no, you will never sit at my right or left hand. Jesus said, I don't know. You don't either, you know. And then he said, yeah, you're going to drink from the same cup that I drink from. And he was right, you know. Ten of the 11 disciples, minus Judas, all were killed as martyrs, including these two, James and John after Jesus' resurrection. And so it upset the other disciples because they enjoyed being on the same level of mediocrity together. Mediocrity loves company. And you need to hear me say today that whenever it's time for you to graduate, in any season of life, when it's time for you to aspire, when it's time for you to increase, when it's time for you to move up and go forward and do great things in Jesus' name, for, for you to 
to, to be promoted every time you make a move in the positive direction. There will always be people from your present and your past who are jealous enough to want to hold you back. They might be your friends. They might be your family. They will love their jealousy more than they love you. Sometimes when you're called and on your way toward becoming the person God has called you to be, they will go out of their way to remind you of the person you always been. The person you used to be. And in that moment, that key moment, you're going to have to decide who will lead whom. Will you be the voice that leads your friends and family out of their own mediocrity? Or will they be the voices that lead you back to yours? Who will influence whom? Whose voice will be heard? And more importantly, whose voice will you hear? Will you choose to hear their voices telling you who you were? Or will you choose to trust God's voice reminding you who you are becoming? It's a critical choice to make whenever you come to one of those crossroads, those graduation points in life. Number six, everyone is a slave. Choose your master wisely. This is a lesson I've had to learn the hard way again and again. Everyone is a slave, so choose your master wisely. Matthew 20, verses 25 and 26. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles, so these are the ungodly people out there, worldly secular people outside, you know the rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them and their high officials, exercise authority over them, not so with you. Instead, Jesus said, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. So, keep in mind, this is all in context of these disciples wanting to be first with Jesus. So this is, this is really talking about people, them serving Jesus, making Jesus their master. Jesus knew everyone. Is a slave. In fact, he said it point blank. John 8, 34, he said, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Everyone has a master. One of my favorite quotes is one that I shared in a devotional that I wrote last year called uh, 40 Days of Doubt. And it's a quote from the brilliant late author David Foster Wallace who took his own life a few years after um, delivering this commencement address at Kenyon College. So he said this to a bunch of graduates on their graduation day. He was an atheist, by the way, for most of his life. He said, in the day-to-day -day trenches of adult life, there is actually no such thing as atheism. There is no such thing as not worshiping. Everybody worships. The only choice we get is what to worship. And the best reason for choosing a God to worship is that pretty much anything else you worship will eat you alive. If you worship money and things, if they are where you tap real meaning in life, then you will never have enough. Worship your own body and beauty and sexual allure, and you'll always feel ugly. And when time and age start showing, you will die a million deaths before they finally plant you. Worship power, which is what Jesus is afraid the disciples are starting to worship when they want greatness. Worship power. You'll feel weak and afraid, and you will need ever more power over others to keep the fear at bay. Worship your intellect. Being seen as smart, you'll end up feeling stupid, a fraud, always on the verge of being found out, and so on. The insidious thing about these forms of worship is that they are unconscious. They are default settings. What's really interesting to me about uh, this quote and what we're talking about today is that, biblically speaking, worship and service or servanthood are the same word. So the, the Hebrew word avodah means both worship and service as a slave serves. So those, are, those two words, we've separated them out, actually means the same thing. Whenever you worship here on Sunday morning, this is just practice. Right here is just practice. And when you leave here, you get to decide how you're going to worship, who you're going to serve, who your master will be. And, and here we try to learn how to put Jesus in that place where he belongs. And so biblically speaking, worshiping something or, or someone and, and being a servant or slave to that something or someone, exactly the same thing. So the obvious question then is whom will you serve? Who is your master? Or what is your master? Who do you worship or what do you worship? The disciples wanted greatness. 
They're on the verge of wanting greatness more than they want Jesus. But Jesus said, listen, boys, I can't make you great the way I can make you great unless you learn to serve me first. Unless you learn to be slaves first. That's the only way this works in my kingdom, he said. And I'm sure in their minds, as many of you might be thinking, how in the world do you serve Jesus today? How do you become a slave to Jesus? Did you just go to church every day of the week? Like that sounds, that sounds awful. Like how, how do you be a slave to Jesus? Do you have to be that religious? Do your kids have to be perfect? Do you have to tuck your shirt in every day and wear a belt and a tie? Like what does it mean to serve Jesus as a slave? Luckily for us, Jesus outlines it perfectly, and it's not what you think. He outlines it in the same gospel, Matthew's gospel, just a few chapters later. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells you exactly what it means to serve him and be a slave to him. Jesus says, whenever you give food to someone who's hungry, whenever you give water to someone who's thirsty, whenever you go out of your way to provide for someone who has nothing, Whenever you care for someone who's sick, someone no one else wants to touch or be around. Whenever you befriend a stranger or an immigrant in your midst. Whenever you go and visit the prisoner that everyone else has forgotten because out of sight, out of mind, whatever. Whenever you do to the least of these, you do to Jesus himself. When you become a servant to the least of these, you become a servant to Jesus himself. That's what it means to be a slave of Christ in this world. That's what it means to have Christ and nothing else, no one else as a master over you. To serve someone who is really in need is to serve Jesus himself. Number seven, finally, is if you want to win at anything, you must be willing to give up and lose everything. Jesus continues, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Over the past couple of months, we've had these uh, big consultations with different two different firms that are like church expert kinds of firms and they've come to tell us about ourselves and that, that's the reason the coffee's free now and all that, so y'all are, y'all are, you have them to thank. <laughs> we've learned a lot. Mostly we learned a lot about you. I, I, I kind of saw this, but I had no idea to the extent, but both of these firms, independently of each other, said the story Houston draws in such a strong concentration of natural leaders. Leaders entrepreneurs, people of great influence and and social status. You are the people, generally speaking, you are the people your friends follow. And that's why you're always moving and shaking and changing jobs and moving towns and going upward and trying to succeed. And all of that is really good. I think all that can be God-ordained to be ambitious and influential in the city. Just imagine if a whole room full of people like this, and we do this four times a day, imagine if we all, caught fire for Jesus, and all of our, the circles of influence all saw that in us. Imagine if we just preached and lived and loved like Jesus in our social circles and in our jobs and with our families. Imagine the potential. It's tremendous. But the reason it kind of scares me too and intimidates me a little bit is because I know that at every graduation, at every promotion, at every single step up the ladder, you're not the only one who sees an opportunity your enemy does too. At every step. Your enemy sees an opportunity as well. Because if your enemy can lead you to love possessions more than people, just a little bit. If your enemy can lead you to believe that your house, brick and mortar, matters more than the immigrant who helps you keep it clean or helps you keep the yard looking nice. If you are led to believe that stuff matters more than people or that the only ROI that really matters is money, then he's got you where he wants you. And at every step up the ladder, there's more and more darkness and isolation and influence for the enemy. But Jesus gave his life as a ransom for many. So to follow him is to do the same thing, y'all. It's to give your life away. I'm begging you. Because I love you, I'm begging you to not wait until you have more to be more generous with what you have. 
Establish generosity when you have less so that when you have more, you'll be even more generous. Live for Jesus when you have less so that when you have more, you'll live for Jesus all the more. When you are a person of little influence, love Jesus with all your heart so that when he makes you a person of great influence, you'll love Jesus with all your heart and everyone you're influencing will learn to love him too. Listen, to follow Jesus is to become a living sacrifice, a servant of Christ who cares more about souls than stuff. We all know stuff is nice. Hallelujah. I see the screens and your phones right now. All the stuff, it's all nice. But you don't live for it. You can live without most of it, truth be told, and it's all going away anyway. To live for Jesus means that it doesn't matter what car you arrived here in today because we're all going to end up in that same black limo one day. All of us are going to end up in the same exact car in the end. And as one guy told me on the way out of the 940 service, he said, I've never seen a U-Haul attached to one of those either. I said, amen. That's exactly right. You can't take it with you. Jesus said you can't serve two masters. And if the thought of living without Jesus sounds bad, but the thought of living without stuff sounds worse, you found your master. And money is a cruel master. And the only way to find life, real life, is to give yours away. Your life, your heart, your possessions for the sake of someone else, for the sake of Christ. Don't wait. Do it now. So that when you have what Jesus wants to give you, you'll live for Jesus with all that you have. I've lived with many masters in my life. I have lived as a slave to many masters, and I've shared a lot of that with a lot of you up here and in one-on-ones. And I will tell you, Jesus is the only master I've ever found who truly sets his servants free. If you want to be free, keep Jesus where he belongs Serve him and only him. Live for him with all that you have. And he'll set you free indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we for your love and for your kindness with us, your grace and your patience. As we work through these temptations that often uh, hold us captive, God. Set us free from the trappings of this world. We know that um, you gave us this sense of ambition, and it, that is from you. And you want us to learn and grow and lead and serve. God, help us not to shy away from that, but at the same time, help us to do all of it for the sake of you and your kingdom and sharing your love and your gospel with the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.